In this video, I'm checking out this. The Tamron 20-40 f2.8 lens for full-frame Sony E-mount cameras from a videographer's perspective. With a less common zoom range, I'm wondering who is this lens for? Is it good value? And what kind of image quality can we expect? All of this to come, but if you're new around here, I'm Harv. And I have lots of videos about videography and audio gear reviews and tutorials on my channel, so consider subscribing if you haven't already. I always get straight to the good stuff in these videos. And as ever, I've timestamped everything so you can just skip to the bit you want. These videos are also not brought to you by any company or sponsor, except for maybe my Patreon backers. The way that works is any funds from Patreon go back into the channel, I buy gear, review it, and then give the gear to my backers. If that's of interest, it's inexpensive to be a backer. All the details below, and let's get on with it. What is this lens? The Tamron 20-40 f2.8 Di3 VXD lens is a wide to kind of standard focal range lens, and clearly the aim was to give users a very commonly used range whilst retaining a wide max aperture and keeping the weight to a minimum. DI3 just means that it's for Sony E-mount, and VXD means voice coil extreme torque, and that's basically Tamron's highest end focus motor, so that's all good news. Optically, this has 12 elements in 11 groups, with four LD low dispersion, two GM glass molded spherical, and one hybrid spherical lens, and all of that jargon. Basically, all lenses these days are sharp looking, uh, give loads of contrast, and they're well made. So that's a modern, but not crazy complex design, which should help on the weight side of things. You can also customize some of the functionality on these lenses using Tamron's lens utility software. Right now I've got the 35 to 150 plugged in and that has buttons that you can customize, which the 20 to 40 doesn't have, but you can still customize the way that the focus ring works. And of course you can update firmware as well. It also has nine rounded aperture blades, which bodes well for, you know, if you're gonna stop the lens down a little bit and the background blur, it should help, you know, with the, the aesthetic of that. I was actually surprised with how how close you can focus with this lens. At 20 millimeters, you can focus as close as 17 centimeters from the sensor, which is pretty close and nice to have. So I can definitely see this lens being good in tight spaces. Anyway, next onto build quality, and the 20 to 40 for me seems on par with a lot of the other Tamron lenses that I've looked at recently. Very similar, in fact, to the 50 to 400 and 28 to 75 G2. It's extremely light at only 365 grams, and because of this, I can imagine that for some, the first time picking up this lens might give the impression that it's not well built just because of its weight. And don't be fooled, heavy doesn't necessarily equate to being well built and vice versa. It's only about eight and a half centimeters long and the barrel only extends a little. This lens is gonna be a joy for traveling with. It's also weather sealed and Tamron have been absolutely just smashing it in this department as all of the Tamron lenses that I've used over the past few years have been weather sealed. So what's not to love about that? All lenses should be weather sealed, don't you think? Next onto the user experience and with this lens mounted on a standard Sony body, this is the a7 IV, it barely adds any weight, so it feels like a really convenient lens to use. The focus and zoom rings feel really nice, but if you'll notice, there are no switches on the barrel. Personally, I prefer to have functions available via switches, especially switching between autofocus and manual, something I do really frequently. Anyway, now let's have a look at what this lens can do.
next I wanted to check out a few of the other aspects of this lens's performance, starting with lens breathing or focus breathing. And let's just pause there if you're not sure what that is. Focus breathing is where when you move your focus point, your field of view changes and it's a really negative thing and it's one of the many reasons why cinema lenses are so expensive because they don't have it. And I always like to show this old clip from my Samyang 35mm f1.4 review that I did years ago as an example of bad focus breathing. Anyway, back to our clip and this is at 40mm and you can see a quite significant amount of focus breathing. So that's not amazing. And I found the same thing on the wide end at 20 millimeters. However, if you've got one of the newer Sony cameras that has Sony's breathing compensation built in, that's gonna take care of this and this is not gonna be a problem for you whatsoever. As you can see from the lines in these clips, we've got barrel distortion at the wide end and pin cushion distortion on the long end which some people will find undesirable. However, when buying lenses, distortion bothers me less and less these days, and for a few reasons. One obvious one being that if you're a stills shooter, which I am not, it's a one-click fix in Lightroom. And with video, it's a little bit more tricky, but we can also correct this using software like Motion VFX M Film Look, which I previously reviewed. And as you can see from these results, it's brilliant software. I'll link that review below if you're interested. The other thing is this is part of the character of the lens. I know many will disagree with this and they're like, no, no, just distortion isn't evil and no. But you know, from looking at the footage that I just showed you, I don't think I would have looked at it and noticed that it's there. It's only if you're shooting, like the clip of my desk just here that you saw earlier where it really was obvious that there were lines there. Anyway, enough about distortion. Moving on to value for money and alternatives. And let's look at some of the competition for a bit of context. Firstly, we've got the Tamron 17 to 28 f2.8. It costs more, it's bigger, it's heavier, and it has a shorter zoom range. Then we have the Sigma, a company I love, 16 to 28 f2.8. It costs even more, it has a shorter range again, it's also bigger and heavier. And then we have the Sony 16 to 35 f4 G. I've only included this because the price is not a million miles away but it is still quite a bit more expensive. However, it is lighter than this Tamron 20 to 40, but the value, I don't think this is a good value lens personally. So whilst I would say that the Tamron 20 to 40 isn't an inexpensive lens, it's certainly far better value than the aforementioned Trio. You know, value is not something that I'm going to include in my pros and cons, just because I think in this case it's more complicated than, you know, good or bad. So, yeah. Anyway, let, let's now move on to my pros and cons, and I'll start with the pros because I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Starting with the pros and the size and weight, you gotta love it. It's small, it's light, and it's so convenient to use. I actually think the focal range is a very useful range to have. The build quality is deceptively good, and I say deceptively because, you know, it's a light lens, but it's still well made. It's weather sealed. I love it, and this is really important for video guys and stills guys. This is a great lens for gimbal use and travel videography. Gimbal use in particular because of that useful zoom range. This has a really high quality focus motor. This adds something to the aesthetic that I just love. Speaking of the aesthetic, this gives you a very detailed and interesting looking image in my opinion. And then onto the cons, and you get some distortion on both ends of the zoom range. Yes, I don't mind it that much, but it is something to bear in mind, and you know, it's also correctable. The focus breathing performance on this lens wasn't the best. Thankfully, this is not something you'll notice so much on Sony cameras that have the breathing compensation, but if your camera doesn't have that, you might notice it. There are no switches on the barrel. I would have liked to have a manual to autofocus switch, as I use this all the time. Finally, to my opinion, and this is just such a great little lens that's brilliant for gimbal work, although some of you might prefer a little more range, it's also gonna be good for, you know, as, as a, a vlogging lens. Do, do people still vlog? I don't know, tell me. And just a few other comments. Personally, I wouldn't want to leave the house with just this lens, and that's only because I have a, a bit of a penchant for longer focal lengths. I'd also say this is the lens for me, I'm gonna be leaving it at its widest max aperture. Most of the time anyway. Why? Well, 
detail side of things, you're going to get enough detail from this lens at any aperture. Because, you know, modern lenses are all just sharp. It's just not a problem. But the main reason is, you know, with the wider end of this lens in particular, it becomes more and more difficult to get that subject separation. So that's why I need the shallowest depth of field I can get. And that's why I'm probably going to be leaving it open. Anyway, that's it for now. I just hope you found this interesting and helpful. Do you agree? What did I miss? Definitely let me know in the comments section below and I'll be down there as much as I possibly can be. I've now made hundreds of videos like this on my channel, of which YouTube has recommended this video for you to watch next, and the one below is my most recent upload. Until next time, let's help each other out and shoot better video. See you guys.